Hello and welcome to Education Talk. Now on this program we bring solutions to challenges faced by all those who are stakeholders when it comes to education. And Wilma, you're very welcome to this program and we'll be looking at the recently released GCSE results and the impact so far on the students. Today, to discuss these various issues with me is Dr. Chrissy Mafidon, who is a consultant in education. Dr. Chrissy, you're very welcome to our studios today. Thanks for your kind invitation. Quite a lot of things going on, a lot of reactions when it comes to the GCSE grades. Now, the results were released yesterday, but exam officials revealed that 68.8% of entries scored A star to C which is a 0.7 percentage point increase on last September. But overall pass rate was down 0.2 percent. And there was a very sharp fall when it comes to English grades. Now, why the fall? It's unfortunate that most of the students have been literally having their education ruined by policies midway through their studies. The GCSE program is normally a two-year program. So if you start, you complete in two year cycles. What happened here was that they started midway through, the rules changed. The, the, the coursework was seen as an integral part of their work. They wanted some independent research, they wanted students to be able to read and critique materials on their own without any supervision. That was the rules when we started. Midway through, they now said, oh no, we don't think the coursework really tests anybody's rigor. They now change the coursework percentage and the contribution of the component of the coursework to the overall grades. So these results that we're looking at should not be compared with last year's results because the conditions that produced last year's results are totally di different from the ones that are producing this year's results. So if we want to compare the two, uh, which we must compare two of the same thing, not apples with oranges. Uh, so the students should be congratulated for doing, being able to cope with such um, upheaval in the middle of um, preparation for exams and the the percentage um, decrease is very very trivial compared to what was anticipated. Which means we need to give the students some time to really get adjusted to the new system and the policies and then, then we can make a comparison between this year and next year's GCSE results. And the government should know this that you shouldn't roll out any program without first of all piloting it. I don't think uh, uh, that's rocket science. I think everybody should have been aware of the fact that if you want to test anything, you take a small sample and then you test it. And based on the feedback you get from that uh, small sample, you now roll it out. But in this case, it was hastily done. It was done without preparations. It was done without even adequate information to those playing, uh, playing a key role in the entire process. So um, I hope any student out there is still feeling very bad because of the outcome of their exams because it's not a true reflection of their abilities or their inner character in, character in terms of um, ability to be able to withstand three papers in one day. They, that's another thing they did. They altered the exam timetable so that some students were writing one paper per day, others were writing four different subjects in one day. How can you do that? Quite interesting. Some of these students seem to have really adjusted to this new exam uh, policy and rules because between A star and C, we had a 0.7 percentage uh, point increase on last summer. Good for them. I, 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 each of the is made with last summer, I, I, I would cringe because last summer students had the opportunity for retakes. So they wrote the exams in January. If they were not happy, they wrote it in March. If they were not happy, then they wrote it in June. They have four different opportunities to write the exam every year. These ones had only one only opportunity, one and they had to write it in June. So if the student was ill, if anything was going wrong with the student at any point, at that point in time, there's absolutely nothing anybody can do about it. All you need, oh, was, was that the result? Yes, let's run with it. I, I don't believe any student should feel bad on the basis of the result there. In fact, it doesn't reflect your ability. It couldn't be seen to be reflecting your, your true ability. What about those who want to retake the GCSE exams? Oh, before you retake, uh, I think you, you can key into our webinar coming up. Um, uh, the uh, free webinar is an online class. A retake will be the last resort now. The first thing I would want any student to do is read what is on the piece of paper. It states categorically that is provisional. The meaning of that word is that the, your current grade, I should say today, is very subject to change. 
If you're not happy with the grade, the first thing you should do is come to our website, pick up the UMS, find out the grade boundary between your UMS that gave you the grade, because each time you have a grade, there is a common corresponding mark. Now, those set of marks should be the one that every student should be working on. So get your mark, see how close that is to the upper boundary of the grade that you are next to. So if, for instance, a student gets a C, find out the grade boundary between C and B, and see how many marks you are from that particular boundary. If you are more than nine marks off, then try and see whether you can get express marking. You need to be able to see that your marks were well marked, clerically checked, and well computed. If you don't have your UMS score, request for your board specific UMS score. You must get that. If you don't get that, what you have is a piece of paper that is just produced by your school and just transfer the software between Edexcel, OCR, AQA, all the various exam board onto your school software has 13 possible rooms for error. So make sure that there is no error between what your school has issued to you and what the board has given you. And also find out that there is no significant difference between your UMS from the next grade. If there is, of course, you know what to do instantly without any hesitation. And as for it especially too, you should be able to have that done within a week. Now let's talk about some of the youngest uh, students to pass uh, GCSE uh, this year. And we have an eight-year-old, Israel, he passed his GCSE maths. That's fine. Israel and a group of other students, Israel, Jason, um, Emmanuel, quite a few primary school students worked through the 21-day um, um, program, which is it's a 21-day course that anybody can follow and be able to achieve a high, very high grade, or in, in fact, in most cases, if you're able to follow it very well, you get the highest possible grade. We have uh, someone that did only 18 days and still was able to get an A. Uh, um, I think that was Jan that was able to get that. So it, it, the group really teaches us one final thing, that exam has nothing to do with your age. It again summarizes everything that this, the school system is all about. That if you are 14, you do this aspect of learning. If you are 18, you can only do this. If you are 16, you have to do this. Your age-related task is, for, if you like, an infringement of the imagination of people that wrote the original curriculum. The curriculum should be rewritten to accommodate flexibility. So that if you have a seven-year-old that is able to speak Latin, give him or her that exposure to Latin. If you have a five-year-old that understands French, give her the opportunity to learn French. We must not cap learning on the basis of chronology. It should be on, on curiosity. And definitely we see more and more uh, young students being able to write exams for maybe 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds and come out with outstanding results. So this tells us that the curriculum needs to be rewritten and the stereotypes need to be taken away. Yeah, it's shattered every stereotype. It's happened with modern languages where you have to write essays. It's happened with maths where it's all logic and numbers. It's happened with PE, where it's supposed to be very physical. It's happened with music. So there is no spectrum, there's no section of learning that cannot be accelerated if there is sufficient interest by the candidate or the student that wants to learn about that. But the school system fails in, one, in this singular fact. They are unable to accommodate that level of giftedness or level of special interest when it comes to achieving your best. How can a parent help a child at uh, the find out, oh, my child is very gifted, let's assume in maths or English or music. How can the parent help the child, you know, uh, develop that gift and accelerate his learning process? Um, it, it, the Gifted and Talented program of the Excellence in Education is a brilliant one if you can get access to it. If you are not physically located, you can get online classes. And uh, two, you need to be able to broaden the interest in that subject. So not just the academic knowledge in terms of content, you are able to see the application of that subject. For instance, if I went shopping, I don't mind my seven or my eight-year-old adding up all the things I'm buying in the trolley before we get to checkout point. What am I doing? I'm trying to get the student to do a lot of additions. If I buy more than one item that costs the same, I'm testing multiplication. So there are other practical uses of maths that the parents can encourage the child to get involved in. If he's musically gifted, 
insists that the child joins the junior choir, insists that the child is in junior orchestra, so that the child gets multiple opportunities to be able to practice their skills and show and perform. Because most people really, really are so gifted that they need to be able to express that gift. If they don't, that gift may be become dormant. Now, let's look at those who came out. Maybe they have a very low grade, maybe a gr grade E, and a parent is wondering, what am I going to do? My child has come up with a grade E in maths. Can that grade be changed within the year? Oh, not even within the year. It can be changed within the 21 days. We already have, from this particular cohort of results that were released one week ago, that were published as a U, that change now is a C. What did the child do? The first thing is recognize the exam board. What is the exam board? Then they contacted us, went to our website, and was able to download the grade boundaries, and looked at the UMS, and looked at the published UMS, and saw the difference. It was about 13. One did the student look, the student looked at the predicted grades, because there are grades anticipated by the school for the students. And the predicted grade was a lot higher than what the student was given. They asked for express remark. So they marked, they remarked the entire script, looked at qu each question was revisited by a different person from the original examiner that marked it, and a different number was arrived at, and the grade went up. And you have, when your grade goes up, the amount of money you paid for it to be remarked is refunded to you with apology. And, and that's, that's, that's essentially what I love. That's from a U to a C. Yes. And it, and it can happen to anybody. It, it, it's not board specific. So we've had it with EdExcel PLC, we've had it with AQA, we've had it with OCR. So don't think that because your board is different from the ones that are listed, yours is only. No, every human being is subject to errors. That's why we're humans. The questions were essay questions. There were no multiple choice that were marked by computers. So if a human being reads your sentence or and a third person comes back and reads it again, they may have a different opinion, they may have a different reading, and the UMS will therefore change. So it's provisional. That's what I want to underline. It's the provisional exam that you have. You don't have a certificate yet. So between now and when the certificate is issued, you have opportunities to go on ATS scheme and be able to, just following systematic, those steps, be able to arrive at the I don't think, I think I did better in this paper. How come I'm getting this grade? Particularly when the other papers that I felt I did badly in, and I'm getting higher grades in there. When, when there's such disparity between performance and output, or between effort and output, it means it's time for you to query it. And if the student still has a U after the query? Oh, if, if you still has a U, please ask for the script back because you want to be able to see what you did wrong. You are entitled to get your script for a, a nominal fee. Make sure that you check the questions and check the answers you provided and the answers you thought you provided because you want to see, because there's a massive difference between the marking scheme, which is what guides the examiner to allocate marks based on your output, and the modal answers, which is essentially what most teachers give students in school. So if you're able to merge this, and know that, oh, this is what was required in the definition of this, and this was what was required in the explanation of this, it then becomes a learning process, and you're able to take the exam again. Let's talk about your 21, day, uh, 21 days learning program. What strategies do you employ to accelerate the learning process of the child? Because, I mean, what they learn in 21 days is what other students spend Almost about three years learning? Yeah, three years. Some even spend five years and still don't, un, unable to get it. The reason why that 21 days is important, the first step on the program is what we just discussed now. How well does the student work under pressure? So we we'll always ask for the script to be seen. Once you've seen the screen, screens, um, you've seen the performance of the student, you be, the student, him or herself, will immediately pick up errors that they made, so that there's, self, uh, there's some element of self-correction. Secondly, the area where knowledge was lacking will be identified. Others, where knowledge was present, but technique was lacking, because the presentation of your facts is, is a key, th is another thing. And lastly, but, uh, the, the last but not the least, is the fact that how well are you able to work under timed conditions? Most class tests and work that people do in preparation run up to the exams are not timed. So you may be able to answer all five questions, but by the time you go to the third, you run out of time. So you now see, how best can I manage my time in answering all questions, because the marks are 
sometimes evenly distributed. Other times, they are weighted towards the last few questions. So if a student is unable to answer the last three or four questions, they've lost out disproportionately. So you want to be able to answer all questions, and you want to be able to do that within time. So that's one thing every participant in the program is trained to do. You're trained to do it. You're not just told to do it. That means you're told to do it, then you do it, and then you supervise until you are able to get all, all the all points correct. So most times, the problem is not that the knowledge is lacking. The content is there. There is the techniques, the presentation, and time management. That's what is sad about the exam. Most people in the class, anyone that has ever been in the class before will understand this. You have people that are able to answer questions during class discussion, and you can almost bet that they are going to top the class. And when the result comes out, Something, something went wrong. How can somebody that was so confident in class and so knowledgeable, evident to both the teachers and the peers, now score a lower grade? Because they have not been trained in the act of exam technique. And that's ignored in, in mainstream schools. It definitely ignored. The teachers have so much to do in their burden. They have complained their burden with a lot of administrative work. Let's talk about your future webinars for parents. What are the parents going to be learning? What are the things that ideally the schools wouldn't uh, make known to them that they are going to be learning? It, it, it's very sad because the time you spend, the average time a teacher spends with a parent every academic year is less than 10 minutes. That means discussing your student, your child with you. Which is too short. It, it, it means that the partnership is starved of vital information. For example, you need to know what key stage my son is, not just the year, what key stage is my son in or my daughter in. If he's in this key stage, how significant is this key stage in the coming key stages? So if my son has just written key stage one exams, what do I need to do now that he's preparing for key stage two? If it's, if it's on key stage three, what do I need to do now? So parents are informed about the significance of the current key stage that their son or daughter are in. Is in. And then which one is the most strategic in the entire school system? So because if you don't plant when you are supposed to plant during the planting season, you will not be able to reap anything, literally. You need to be able to seed into a child. If a child steps into key stage two, it is just too important for anybody to delegate to a third party. Because your key stage two will inevitably affect where the child goes to secondary school. So if you have a very great key stage two, you go to top secondary school. That's a leg up. Now, if you have a very lousy key stage two, what's going to happen is that you are not, you are not able to get a top secondary school. That sets the child back two or three years in m most cases. If the child is therefore not challenged, it's not put in an environment where it's challenged. And then when you're applying to scholarships, you find that that child is disadvantaged. Not because he doesn't have the ability, but because of the ignorance of the parents in preparing the child for the various scholarships. When it comes to key stage four and five, you need to know which subjects are required by the university you are applying to. So if you don't know that, and therefore align the subjects up with what you want to study at uni, then you end up studying biology, psychology, and history, and your desires to read pharmacy or medicine, that, that, that cannot work, it doesn't work. So you need to be able to know things that are going to happen two or three key stages ahead of time so that the child has adequate time to prepare and to pick the right subject for the right course or uh, program they want to do at uni. So for parents out there who are wondering when is the next webinar, well, you can get information by logging on to www.excellenceineducation.org. UK. It is important because a lot of students miss out on opportunities not because they are not intelligent or lack the ability, but because the parents haven't planned enough. They haven't been told anything. They've not been given the deadlines. There are deadlines for scholarships. If you apply after the deadline, it's automatic failure. If you apply before the deadline, you're given good con consideration. The dates are privileged. They are not even given, they are not published. They are only made known in certain websites. They are not given to the schools, they are not given to the students. So how do you get students prepared for the top schools? The open days are not published. Again, they are privileged. One would want the open days to be sent to all the students on the government database by a simple email. One simple email will mass uh, mass mail everybody on the government database, but that's not never done. It will cost nobody nothing to send one email to a thousand um, parents of students in Key Stage 1, for instance, or students in Key Stage 2. But that has never been explored. We need to be able to arm, our, to arm our parents so that they can position their children for the best possible, because they are they're entitled to the best. 
They are entitled to the best indeed. So parents, it is absolutely important to prepare for your child's next step in his or her academic years. To get more information, you can log on to imafidons.com or send emails to educationtalk at loveotv.co.uk. Now, what should a parent do to prepare that child for the next academic year? The new academic year is just starting. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah that's right. September is around the corner. Most, most parents ignore this. The first thing you must do to prepare a child is understand who the new teacher is. Understand who the new teacher yes. is. Yes. The priorities of the new teachers has to be known to you because the, next, the, the, new, the new teacher is a human being. You must make sure that you meet the teacher in the first available opportunity to be able to clarify what their priorities for the year will be, to clarify what are the requirements for this particular year, and then know the disposition of the teacher. Because if you understand the teacher, you'll be able to communicate with the teacher. Now, if you don't understand the teacher, you might say, oh, I think this teacher is too harsh, or this is the teacher is too laid back, or the way the subjects have been taught uh, is funny. You start having doubts about it. But if you have had a communication, uh, they will give you the why of what they are doing. We uh, of just seeing the what of what they are We're just rounding up now, but something that makes a lot of uh, children stand out in class or anywhere they go is the self-confidence of the child. Now, what can the parent do to help the self-confidence of the child? Knowledge is its power. If you are comfortable in the information you are going to be given, and you'll be given that information beforehand, there's no, there's no way you are going to be looking down when someone is asking you, oh, you're going to be shy. You're going to be confident, because you already know what we are discussing, or you already know what the year is about. So if you are able to download the, K, the, KS, the, the, the different KS syllabuses, download the specification, and chat over that with your son. You don't have to give him a class. Don't give him a lecture. Just say, what does this relate to? How is this going? And then, Go over what was taught last academic year because it will form the basis for the modern for the new academic year. Which means the parent has to be acquainted with the curriculum, the, the, curriculum, the, the parents the need stages to stages and everything. Yeah, get hold of the, uh, the the bag of the student, turn it upside down, take all the items out, and then chat with the child. That's all. You, you, whatever is in the bag belongs to you, and you can chat over that. We'll home. continue this next week because we are running out of time. But thank you so much for coming on this program, and we'll talk about the self confidence of the child next week. Thank You're welcome. You. Thank you. Well, viewers, this is Education Talk. Now we bring solutions to challenges faced by all stakeholders in education, starting from the student who is at the center of the educational system to teachers, parents, and policymakers. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the rest of our programs.